Last time, we previewed the importance of portraiture as a genre of British art. Though most of our class will take place between 1750 and the early 20th century, we will begin with an artist born in 1599, arguably the most important Flemish artist of the 17th century after Peter Paul Rubens. Anthony van Dyck was the most important representative of courtly portraiture in British tradition, and his uh, dates of life and death, uh, he was born in 1599 and died in 1641. So today we'll ask some key questions about Van Dyck the artist. Who was he? What were his influences? What were his contributions to British portraiture that will uh, weave in through the rest of the class? How did the courtly culture impact the strategies of his representation, his paintings? And who briefly were artists influenced by Van Dyck? Again, in a, a subject we will um, continue to discuss throughout the semester. So Anthony Van Dyck, who you see in a uh, really lovely sort of emotional self-portrait on the screen in front of you, uh, gained fame for painting Charles I of England, um, the King of England, and we'll see many of these, uh, his portraits today. Van Dyck was a foreign artist born in Antwerp and he was trained in the Flemish tradition. The 17th century was a moment before British artists really established important institutional structures to train and promote artists. And here I'm talking about the Royal Academy, um, which we'll discuss in this class, the big institution for the training of artists and the exhibition of art in England. So. Back um, in the 17th century, this was a time when the Netherlands and Flanders was producing some of the most incredible art in Europe. This was because a merchant class uh, ran um, the Flemish region um, and made a lot of money on trade. Um, Amsterdam, Antwerp, the Netherlands, this was a big um, uh, area of trade. Um, and so this wealthy middle class, upper middle class, meant that there was a proliferation of patrons of art. So in addition to religious imagery, many of these patrons wanted portraits, right? Um, also still lives, paintings, in other words, appropriate for their homes. And as you saw in your reading, an English countess asked Peter Paul Rubens um, the most famous Flemish artist of his day, to paint her while she was in Antwerp. And Rubens then came to work in London for decorative panel and portrait commissions, um, including to then Prince Charles. Uh, and we'll get to Rubens again in a second. Van Dyck, um, again who you see on your screen, was a child prodigy. Before the age of 20, um, so likely younger than some of you in this class, he was a master in a painter's guild, a kind of union for painters, and he became the head assistant in Rubens' studio. Now, Van Dyck was most famous for his portraits, although he did uh, paint religious paintings as well, which we'll see next. Remember that this was the height of the Reformation and Counter-Reformation in Europe, a moment where there was this intense battle over the status of images. So something called iconoclasm was happening in mass. Um, iconoclasm was the destruction of images uh, that Protestants felt was a, a critical counter-argument um, against the, the imagery in Catholicism. So as uh, many, as the Protestant religion was calling for the destruction or elimination of images in religious practice, um, Rubens, a Catholic, um, painted even more sort of vibrant, um, vivid religious imagery to oppose the iconoclasm of the Reformation. And so this is called the Counter-Reformation, the sort of battle over images. 
the Flemish Baroque studio of Peter Paul Rubens was incredibly influential at this moment. And Rubens' style would be fashionable in London as wealthy patrons uh, visited him and purchased his paintings. And so we finally see Rubens here on your screen. Um, you see Rubens, Samson, and Delilah of 1609-1610. And then you see uh, Van Dyck's image of Samson and Delilah um, in reverse uh, next to Rubens' painting. So we have the master on the left and the head assistant on the right, right, painting a few years after Rubens. And so in this comparison, let's think about what Van Dyck takes from Rubens's paintings, um, what are the similarities? Um, well, for one, he draws pretty explicitly on the composition of Rubens. Um, this is a side-on view, right? We're looking at a figural group from the side, not from the front. And a muscular Samson is slumped on Delilah's lap. Um, in Van Dyck's painting, of course, this is presented in reverse. Um, and this is because he was probably looking at a print of Rubens' painting, um, which would have been presented in reverse. Stylistically, we see uh, Van Dyck drawing from the exaggerated uh, fleshiness and musculature of Rubens' painting. Um, we see uh, skin and flesh on display in the decolletage, the exposed breast of um, Delilah, and the um, incredibly intense musculature of Samson's back. Rubens also had a fascination with textiles and textures. Um, I want you to just look on the bottom, uh, bottom right of Rubens' painting at this really incredibly described gold brocaded fabric. We might also see Van Dyck's painting as a challenge to his master's work, asserting his position um, as he uh, wanted to establish himself as a painter in his own right. So how does Van Dyck's image depart from Rubens? Well, in Rubens' painting, the scene is uh, inside of a bedchamber at night, um, right? You have this kind of chiaroscuro effect of uh, a candlelight um, lighting the left-hand side of the painting. You even have a candle held by the sort of old woman um, coming in on the scene, um, lighting, uh, providing light as a young man cuts Samson's hair. Van Dyck, on the other hand, presents this scene outside in bright daylight. You see the blue sky um, behind the figural group, uh, behind Samson's head. In Rubens, the cutting of Samson's hair is underway. That's what makes the scene exciting, right? We have scissors uh, being uh, taken to the hair held aloft um, in the left center of the painting. In Van Dyck's, however, he, he chooses the moment before. He's trying to exploit a moment of tension to create a greater sense of drama, right? And I want you to look at the exaggerated reactions of the women on the right-hand side of the painting, right? They're sort of uh, gasping and holding their breath before the hair is cut and Samson's powers are diminished. Van Dyck also gives greater agency to Delilah, to the woman in the scene. With a raised finger, she orchestrates an entire company of characters, um, whereas she's a bit more passive in Rubens' work. And again, you have in Van Dyck's painting the theatrical reactions of the rest of the characters especially the woman at back whose fingers are splayed against the sky. Now, you can see that she's been entirely added in. She's been invented in Van Dyck's painting um, to create more theatricality. So Van Dyck gives us an image outdoors with a peak of dramatic blue sky. Uh, he shows a fleeting moment indicated by uh, the gestures and glances by the figures. 
and these qualities will be carried out into his portraiture. So as a painter of religious pictures and mythological scenes, both from classic and modern history, Rubens had a much broader impact in uh, the art history books than Van Dyck. But as a portraitist, particularly in England, Van Dyck was far more influential. Both Rubens and Van Dyck enhanced their reputation through the circulation of prints made after their paintings, um, which I'll show you on the next screen. Here you can see the print um, after Peter Paul Rubens, Samson and Delilah, uh, a print that Van Dyck likely looked at while making his own uh, compositional choices for his uh, rendering of the same scene. So they both used prints, and this is how many people, both in Flanders and in England, had access to art in the days before the Royal Academy held big public exhibitions. You likely weren't invited into um, the Palace of the King or um, the homes of wealthy patrons, and so the way that most people saw art in the 16th, 17th centuries was through prints like the one you see at left. Uh, Van Dyck also adopted Rubens's practice of painting studies of live models, usually bust length, for characters in religious pictures. He wanted that sa those same um, vivid qualities, the same sense of um, the presence of live flesh to um, vivify his painted work. So he takes lessons from Rubens um, as his teacher, um, but he also seeks to depart from that teacher. Anthony Van Dyck was hired as the official court painter to Charles I in 1632, a big job. And Charles I, you see him at left, will spend some time with this portrait. Rubens called King Charles I, um, formerly a prince, the greatest lover of painting among the princes in the world. Charles amassed the largest collection of art of any British monarch in history, um, purchasing 1,500 paintings, about 1,500 paintings and 500 sculptures, all of incredible quality. He collected works by Renaissance masters, but also contemporary artists like Rubens and Van Dyck. Sorry guys, my baby is crying. Charles was the connoisseur of both the visual arts and the theater. And as he was building this enormous collection, he hired Van Dyck as his, uh, as a professional artist sort of on his staff, giving him a lavish home and a generous stipend. Now, the painting at right um, is by Hans Holbein the Younger who was the most important official court painter before Van Dyck. So this is a different king. This is Henry VII. Um, and uh, Holbein was welcomed into England by Erasmus. He joined the intellectual circle of, sorry, Henry VIII, guys. He joined the intellectual circle of Thomas More. He was an advisor to Henry VIII. Um, and we're going to discuss this detailed likeness of um, Henry VIII next meeting. Um, we're going to go back in time a little bit, sort of breaking the chronology of the class next Tuesday. Um, but I just wanted to show you briefly um, that though we have um, some incredible illusionistic detail in Holbein's portrait of the king, um, it, it has some of the flatness and remove um, that uh, Van Dyck will not have, right? That Van Dyck's training under Rubens with the fleshy contours, with the musculature of Rubens, um, will really depart from. So these will be very different portraits. Um, and that, in part, is because Holbein um, uh, worked as a woodcutter, as a printmaker, um, and so the flatness was more appropriate. So again, we'll discuss this really incredible portrait um, of Henry VIII next time. So we're going to take a closer look at Van Dyck's portrait of Charles I on horseback. He painted this portrait soon after 
uh, the king asked Van Dyck to become the official court painter. You can see just a year later, 1632 to 1633 is when he painted this. So let's think about how this portrait acts as a propaganda tool and what Van Dyck is trying to communicate about the king, Charles I. Well, this portrait should leap out to you, especially in contrast to the previous portrait of Henry VIII that we just briefly saw, in that it's so theatrical, right? Look at the background here. We have um, uh, a dramatic archway, um, uh, theatrical curtains. Um, we have vibrant colors, dramatic movement being represented, a really striking composition here um, inside of a stage-like setting. The background, that uh, rendering of sky and landscape behind Charles, um, is almost flat. It's really not the point here. And some portraits, as we'll see later on in this class, will do different work, right? They'll show a sort of depth of landscape, a depth of background to show the kinds of uh, land that uh, the aristocrat um, uh, was in charge of, had ownership of. But here, it's really theatrically flat. It looks like a stage. Um, and that arch um, above the king on horseback refers to the triumphal arches of ancient processions after a war. Um, so in Rome, uh, you have triumphal arches where uh, emperors would um, sort of parade um, from and to after a war. Um, so this has a kind of military uh, valence here, military meaning. You can also see the king is dressed um, in armor in a, um, uh, in a military way, right? See that the really incredible way that Van Dyck describes the shining texture of armor in contrast to the other textures in the painting. So this is a strong message of regal power here, um, emphasizing Charles I's divine right to rule. Um, and we have uh, some of that reflected in the second man in the painting. This is an equerry. This is um, uh, a man in charge of um, Charles's horses. He's carrying uh, Charles the First helmet, um, and he's there to assist with the um, the royal horses. And he's looking up at the king in admiration, sort of modeling for the viewer what we are supposed to feel. The fact that Charles is on a horse. Um, it's a way of describing the king being in command of his kingdom and his people. He's riding the horse with clear ease and skill. Again, um, the equerry is not looking concerned, but instead is looking in admiration. So we can assume he's the king is doing quite well on the horse. And the armor he wears is the kind used in jousting. So this ancient chivalric tradition of English knights. To the left, a large shield showing the arms of England and Scotland, once two separate kingdoms that Charles's father, James I, had brought together. So doing some political work at left. The equestrian portrait had a long tradition in Italy and ancient Rome, but it was almost unheard of in Britain before Van Dyck's portrait. On the right, I'm showing you the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius made in gilded bronze um, in uh, the, the first century um, BCE, I'm sorry, CE in, of the common era, um, the first century um, AD, in other words, um, it's now called the Common Era. Um, Charles I was a celebrated horseman, so that it made sense to put him on top of a horse, but it also linked him to this long tradition of um, both political and military might. So the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius, um, a very famous portrait of um, uh, an ancient Roman uh, figure, um, is carried through um, in Van Dyck's 
portrait. Um, so it's linking Charles with this um, tr long tradition in Western civilization of military authority and of uh, political rule. Um, Van Dyck is also referencing ancient Rome through that triumphal arch, right? Both military um, success and also um, uh, Roman tradition. So he's, he's showing you that Charles is sort of um, in the natural line of succession, um, political and military, since, uh, you know, in this sort of 1,600-year history. Um, it's hard to challenge, right, the authority of a king um, who is presented as um, being the sort of uh, natural inheritor of this long and important tradition. So this is one of the strategies of this portrait. Two years later, Van Dyck painted Charles I at the Hunt, a very uh, a different portrait strategy here. So what do we notice about this portrait? How does he stage the king? What lessons did he learn from um, the previous portrait? Well, Charles I was self-conscious about being short. Um, so like many portraitists before him, Van Dyck pulls a few tricks so it doesn't seem like he's so short. Um, the horse's head is bent, for instance, so he doesn't um, uh, overwhelm the king in his height. Um, he puts the king on a set of stairs um, and has him looking down on the viewer. He's, so he's elevated in height a little bit. Um, a, a few other tricks in this portrait. Um, he frames the king's face with this the brim of a black hat so it's not washed out by the sky. And he's presenting the king as being incredibly elegant, right? Look at the silk sheen of, uh, of that jacket, right? This is a really elegant person, even hunting out in nature. To, his, uh, to our right, um, we have a horse bowing down to the king, a page uh, you see a sort of adolescent boy is holding the king's hunting jacket and a groom is handling his horse. So this portrait is telling the viewer that this is someone who has servants, right? So he must be important. And again, Van Dyck is drawing on this uh, tradition of equestrian portraits, um, showing the king as being powerful, as being skilled, as being connected to this tradition of uh, military prowess, even off of his horse. Um, he gives us a kind of cursory glance, so there's an informality about this portrait that makes us think that we're getting um, a kind of true, quote unquote, look um, at the personality of the king, making us feel like this portrait isn't as carefully composed and staged as of course it is, right? Um, and again, we have this kind of ease of authority, this ease of being, right? He's leaning on um, a little stick. He's um, comfortably standing um, quite comfortably. This isn't the kind of rigid pose of Holbein's portrait, for instance. So this is a strategy of making authority look easy, right? Um, even though that's not historically true. During Charles's reign, the parliament, the English parliament tried to limit his powers. He also married a Catholic. He had strict ideas about government. Um, and there were two civil wars that took place during his reign, uh, primarily over royal spending. And Charles I was eventually beheaded in 1649. His art collection was broken up and is now spread throughout Europe. But in this portrait, you have no sense of this uh, controversy or challenges or impending doom, right? Van Dyck presents him as being quite confident in his power. He also is showing off as an artist. By putting the king's uh, elbow right in, in that bent arm out towards us, the viewer, um, he's showing us his artistic mastery. It's really difficult, um, and for any of you art majors um, here, you might know this. It's really difficult to uh, pull off this kind of foreshortening effect. Um, and so he's, uh, he's showing his skill off um, in the um, description of horse musculature and 
um, those luscious clothes. He's showing the influence of Titian and Caravaggio, um, as well as Rubens. That elbow jutting out into space is like very Caravaggio, if you're familiar with the Italian Baroque. And the paint strokes he uses, again, we can think about this in contrast to Holbein's portrait of Henry VIII. Um, uh, there's a corollary between the ease of the king's power and the ease of Van Dyck's painterly brush strokes. This is in, in sharp contrast to the controlled glassy strokes of Holbein, who again, we'll discuss next time. Next, we see Van Dyck's incredible self-portrait with Endymion Porter. So what can we say about the composition of this painting? What do the clothes communicate about Endymion Porter, the other figure with the artist and the artist himself? Let's look at posture and gesture and body language um, to try to tease out what the painting might tell us about their relationship. We'll also discuss how the paint is handled um, and uh, why the bodies are positioned as they are in space. So this is a really interesting composition. Um, it's an oval canvas, um, I hope you can see, which is sort of fascinating um, in itself. And it's divided into two separate realms, right? Um, on the left, we have in sort of outside realm. On the right, it's more inside. Um, there's also a contrast between light and dark. Um, the two portraits are divided, one um, that's forward facing, the figure at right, Van Dyck himself, you might recognize him from his uh, younger self portrait, is in profile. And there's a kind of dynamism here in that, created through that contrast. Um, but as as much as this painting is divided, I want you to look down in the middle foreground, um, the very bottom of this painting, to see these two men's hands resting quite closely next to each other. So showing that there is a real relationship there. Um, the division might be uh, put in place to indicate the different social statuses of these two figures um, instead of a kind of emotional division. Uh, let's talk about the fashion here. Now, you might not come into this class with any sense of English fashion, um, but these these codes are actually easier to read um, than one might think, right? This is the age, the 17th century, of the dandy or the fop, um, as you would say, um, if you were um, in England. Um, Endymion, the figure at left, Endymion Porter, was the perfect example of hot, the high fashion of the moment. Um, the length of his curled hair was exactly at the height of fashion. Um, his wasted uh, doublet made out of satin. Um, uh, he would have been wearing breeches uh, with silk ribbons. And um, it was also very fashionable at this moment to have this Flemish bobbin lace um, around his neck. Again, uh, Flanders, the Netherlands, this was sort of where it was at in terms of art and fashion um, at this moment. So um, that lace that's around his neck uh, is both uh, fashionable, but also shows off the skill of the artist here. So Van Dyck is showing Endymion Porter's wealth through his fashion, um, but why do we think Van Dyck is so restrained when it comes to his own appearance? Um, perhaps because, right, he was a working artist, though, uh, the king kept him uh, quite wealthy, right, in, with a, a fairly great, good stipend. Um, he wasn't uh, part of the aristocratic, the landed classes, right? He was he worked for a living. He worked in painting for a living, um, and there might be some of this sort of uh, uh, artists, not quite bohemianism, um, uh, but that sort of fashionable all black um, outfit. Uh, was more appropriate for his station than Endymion's. Van Dyck did not just paint the king. Here we have uh, his portrait of the Countess of Southampton as Fortune from around 1638. So how does this portrait of the Countess differ from the portrait of Charles I hunting? Well, he's showing the Countess, a woman named Rachel de Rouvigny, 
as the goddess Fortune. So this is an allegorical portrait, um, not a portrait of the woman in her living room or around her attributes or doing um, a hobby like hunting, um, but instead in this allegorical mode. Um, Fortune was an immortal born on the clouds, so that's where we see her here. And so he's superimposing two identities onto one portrait, um, a kind of uh, clever layering. Um, this is uh, uh, drawn um, from, so this is a countess, um, so she's part of the court, um, and you know that Charles I supported the theater, um, so uh, this kind of theatricality um, makes a lot of sense in this context. Um, and uh, this theatricality will become very important in the work of uh, Joshua Reynolds and many uh, portraitists that come after Van Dyck. Um, and so putting this, this countess um, as a, the goddess of fortune shows her erudition, her education and culture, um, as well as the artist. But it also, importantly, has a gender difference, right? It takes uh, this woman out of um, contemporary life. So while Van Dyck show, drew from ancient imagery and um, symbols in his portraits of King Charles, um, Charles is shown, right, as a 17th century person, um, not sort of in allegorical form. Um, but he by making Rachel de Ruvigny as a goddess, he's sort of taking her out of contemporary life, um, out of any sort of the realm of political or cultural influence. And so there's a real gender difference in these choices, which again will resonate in the portrait choices that we'll see throughout the semester. I'm showing you Van Dyck's uh, portrait of Charles I at the hunt, um, uh, along with two portraits, uh, one by Sir Joshua Reynolds, um, another by Thomas Gainsborough. These will be really important portrait painters that we're going to discuss pretty soon in this class. Um, just to show you what a huge impact Van Dyck had on British portraiture uh, following him, on Joshua Reynolds, Gainsborough, also Hogarth, who we'll talk about um, at the end of our meeting. So in terms of uh, Gainsborough, the artist at the very right, um, he was the favorite painter of a later king, George III, a monarch who tried in his early years to emulate the authoritative reign of Charles I. Um, so these artistic strategies um, actually mirror the kind of political strategies of the patrons um, of the paintings. And so what are Reynolds and Gainsborough drawing from Van Dyck? Well, the images of the kings and courtiers that we see here um, all suggest a kind of natural grace and ease of authority. Um, all three stand nonchalantly in spacious settings with um, accoutrement, um, uh, these trees, these uh, uh, landscapes that hint at a grandeur beyond them. All three also uh, have this fluidity of brushstrokes, right? Um, they're sensitive to the features of their portrait sitters, but their brushstrokes, um, especially you can see in the trees and landscape beyond them, become quite fluid, right? Become quite brushy, almost um, impressionistic, we would say, um, now. Again, that's very different from the um, glassy brushstrokes of Holbein. So you can really see the kind of influence the Flemish style of Van Dyck had on British portraiture. Um, and the kind of stylistic finesse that would come into fashion. And again, this communicates a kind of effortlessness, a kind of ease and confidence. Um, so the artist, uh, starting with Van Dyck, uh, positioned themselves as much of a, a gentleman as his clients, right? This kind of ease and confidence, um, the ease of a, an aristocrat. Um, of a knight, even though um, they occupied a very different position often in society. So Gainsborough will emulate Van Dyck, um, even to excess, uh, from the 1830s, sorry, from the 1730s, um, 
there would be this kind of vogue for being portrayed in uh, Van Dyke dress. So those that silky jacket that you see on Charles I is going to reemerge a century later um, as being very stylish in portraiture. Um, this culminated in the 1770s when Gainsborough produced the ultimate tribute to Van Dyke, the Blue Boy, that you'll see on the next screen. So on the right, you see Gainsborough's Boy in Blue from 1779. Um, and here we have a youth wandering nonchalantly in a pastoral parkland, in a landscape. And this boy was the son of a proper, prosperous Soho ironmonger. Um, in other words, a member of the uh, wealthy merchant class or industrial class. The canvas is huge. This is something that's hard to communicate on these screens. Um, but the boy in blue is about life-sized, um, emphasizing his importance. And he's shown, even in the 1770s, um, his, his fashion, this sort of uh, silky blue um, outfit he's wearing is Gainsborough's homage to Van Dyke, um, especially a portrait he made of Charles II as a boy. So what are the artists um, like Reynolds and Gainsborough, as much as they're drawing from him, what are they leaving behind? Um, well, we no longer have uh, courtiers, those pages or grooms um, holding the horses. Um, and so the Van Dykeism of the 18th century um, often featured, like the boy in blue, the kind of bourgeoisie, the wealthy middle class, playing at, as being the aristocracy. So they're costuming themselves as the aristocracy, commissioning portraits of themselves in traditions of the aristocracy, um, but not being a part of that group themselves, just being able to afford the portraits. So Wilton calls this portrait uh, a domestication of majesty on page 36. So how, how and why is that? Well, we're seeing the people portrayed as being very human, right? Again, think about this in contrast to Holbein. Um, they're, they're human, we're given um, a specificity in their likenesses. Um, they're shown in a landscape of bucolic elegance um, a kind of idealized, really beautiful landscape behind them. Um, their poses are quite informal, right? They're not rigidly presented um, in uh, symmetrical compositions, but instead they're meant to look, you know, this woman sort of grasping at her dress, the man pointing behind him, the child um, uh, holding her hands in front of her. Um, they're supposed to look informal, even though, of course, this is carefully composed. Um, and so uh, Van Dyke is showing a family uh, holding this kind of relaxed grace um, in settings that sometimes suggest uh, nature is in uh, a wild mood, right? The, na the nature behind these figures, and this will be true with Gainsborough, too, is not always the most um, pristine and uh, uh, trimmed. Um, and cultivated natural setting, but instead can look a little bit wild, which only emphasizes their calm and confidence um, and informality. James Stanley, the Lord Strange, Earl of Derby, was descended from an ancient land-owning family in the north of England that also ruled the Isle of Man. He married the woman you see in the portrait, Charles, or Charles, Charlotte, um, who was related to some of the most prominent aristocratic defenders of Protestantism in continental Europe. Remember that um, the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, this is still a lively, sometimes violent discussion. Both pl played a role in the royalist cause following the outbreak of a civil war in England, and the Earl was eventually beheaded for high treason. So again, quite a tumultuous moment in British history. Here, Lord and Lady Strange form a kind of inverted triangle with one of their daughters, an arrangement that's really stable and classic and simple um, that uh, coexists with a kind of elusive um, iconographic program. 
The island in the background might represent that Isle of Man, right? That um, Lord uh, Strange um, rules. Um, and the color of the young girl's dress, um, this orange might allude to her descent from the House of Orange. Um, so there's a lot of these kind of aristocratic um, signifiers here. The child um, has a bit of mischief and life in her. This is kind of unusual for contemporary portraiture at this moment. And Van Dyck is recognized as being really one of the great child portraitists of his moment. Um, the concept of childhood um, was not developed in the same way as we think of childhood now. Um, you can read there's sort of great histories of this. Um, but children were sort of relegated to being um, infants and then many adults, but childhood is this kind of concept of freedom and mischief uh, like we think of now, uh, didn't really exist then. Um, but we see that kind of uh, liveliness in Van Dyke's representation of children, which was unusual um, and pretty, uh, pretty incredible. So, Van Dyke shows us direct observation, right, um, of the figure's features um, and a kind of sincere emotionalism. And this would be uh, one of his lasting legacies as a portraitist. And we'll end uh, with a comparison of two group portraits of children, one by Van Dyke at left. And at right, we have a group portrait of children, a very famous portrait. Um, by William Hogarth, um, who's an artist that we're going to discuss um, in a lot of detail in this class. So Van Dyke's The Five Eldest Children of Charles I from 1637. It's more of a private or domestic portrait than Van Dyke's portraits of Charles I. Think about him under that Roman arch um, or even hunting. Here the children are shown in a domestic setting, right? They're on the this rug, they're in a kind of living space, um, they're playing with their dogs. Um, the central child uh, who's looking the most sort of poised and regal um, will become Charles II, the, uh, another king of England. And he's, uh, uh, we're looking kind of straight at that child um, and, and not from, from above or below. Right, um, this is the kind of viewpoint of a parent um, and gives us a kind of direct communication or intimacy with children um, instead of uh, kind of looking down upon them as one might expect of portraits of children. The, on the left, we have Princess Mary and James, the Duke of York. Um, they're the older children. They look a bit solemn, kind of playing at adulthood in their little clothes. Um, on the right, we have Princess, Princesses Elizabeth and Anne. Uh, neither child will survive, sadly, um, but they're younger. So Van Dyke shows them sort of not behaving, right, sort of playing um, in a lively way. The two dogs bring together an image of intimate domesticity. Uh, Charles II has his hand on a mastiff, um, showing his kind of mastery over his domain. Um, even as, right, this dog is massive. It's showing his sort of fearlessness with a dog who would um, uh, really sort of overwhelm him if uh, the dog was to stand up. Um, emphasizing the kind of smallness of the children. So this is a lively portrait, um, even as it's a portrait of very important uh, future political figures, right? But we have a sense of kind of liveliness and intimacy um, that was unusual um, and uh, pioneered by Van Dyke. On the right is Hogarth's The Grandchildren of 1742. So this is a century later. Um, and it is a really directly references um, Van Dyke and kind of plays upon it. Hogarth, as we'll see, is going to have a wild sense of humor. He's a satirist, um, even as he paints. Um, and so this is not a royal family, but a bourgeois or middle class family. And Hogarth is showing them appropriating the grand manner and imitating the decorum of the aristocrats. So 
this is an oil painting, um, a group portrait depicting the four children of Daniel Graham, um, who is the apothecary, in other words, the kind of pharmacist to King George II. The youngest child had died by the time the painting uh, was completed. Um, something that's referenced in the kind of iconography of this painting. You can see above that small child on the left, there's a clock on the mantelpiece that's decorated with the figure of Cupid holding a scythe and standing beside an hourglass, um, which are symbols of death. So um, Hogarth sort of conscientiously includes those symbols above that child. Opposite the child is an animated cat. You can see the cat on the chair um, above the little boy at right, um, who's gazing at a caged bird. Um, Again, a kind of uh, foreshadowing uh, iconography there. Um, so Hogarth is um, imitating the conventions of Van Dyck's aristocratic portraiture of children, um, but in a serious way, he's trying to capture the liveliness of Van Dyck's children. Again, something that didn't um, wasn't common outside of Van Dyck's practice. So in our next meetings, we'll go back in time a little bit and discuss Hans Holbein a little bit more in that incredible portrait of Henry VIII. And we'll also dive into the incredible uh, oeuvre or body of work of William Hogarth, who you're just briefly introduced to here.